Hi, colleagues. So the lecture you're about to hear is in honor of the Richard A. Pallet Fund, which was established in 1980 by Theodore Spack. Um, in 2018, it was renamed the Richard A. Pallet Endowed Grand Rounds and Cardiology Fund for the purpose of supporting an outside expert to provide unique expertise and professional development for fellows, residents, medical students, and faculty physicians. Our speaker today, who has been a mentor to me, an inspiration to many more, I'm sure will handily accomplish that. And I will hand over the baton to our chief resident, Dr. Mess Nijic, to introduce our speaker. All right, hi everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Yancey. Uh, Dr. Yancey, he is the Vice Dean of Diversity and Inclusion uh, at Northwestern University. Uh, he concomitantly serves as the Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern and the Associate Director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute at North Northwestern. He holds the Magerstadt Endowed Professor of Medicine Chair and also holds an appointment as Professor of Medical Social, Medical Social Services. He's co-chair of the ACC Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, a former president of the American Heart Association and a recipient of the Gold Heart Award and the James Herrick Medal for Distinguished Achievement in Clinical Cardiovascular Medicine. Dr. Yancey is also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He received two Lifetime Achievement Awards for, for clinical research from Women Hearts and for research and leadership in diversity from the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Dr. Yancey's research interests include heart failure, and he's extensively published with older, over 500 peer-reviewed publications. He is deputy editor in JAMA Cardiology, senior section uh, um, of, the, uh, and of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And he serves on the editorial boards for Circulation, Circulation Heart Failure, uh, American Heart Journal, and Jack Heart Failure. Thank you so much, Dr. Yancey, for coming. Welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. But a special thanks to Dr. Weiss and the organizers for this Department of Medicine Internal Grand Round Series. I'm delighted to have the invitation to share some comments with you that will be different from comments that you, really usually, comments that you usually entertain during Grand Rounds. I want to be particularly um, reflective of how important it is to have philanthropic support for these kinds of discussions. The Richard A. Pallet Fund really is the kind of resource that I, as a chief of cardiology, as a leader in this academic medical center, really embrace because we understand that to do the kinds of educational things that involve engaging others, we need some modest amount of resources to make that happen. And it adds to the educational experience and adds to the culture of our institutions where we can entertain ideas from others. With that having been said, I want everyone to pause for a moment, take a deep breath and exhale. We're going to have a conversation over the next 45 minutes about race. This is one of the most difficult discussions that we can host in today's world. We know that this week marks one year since the murder of George Floyd. There were any number of statements in the contemporary lay press today and yesterday demonstrating that one year later, we still are in awkward places. We still are uncertain about the direction that we're going. We still haven't resolved how we wrestle with this problem that continues to be part of our American society and our culture. Those of us in healthcare and in the oversight of health are not immune from this tension. And that then is the substance of what I want to do. So I'm going to share my screen with you and begin, but begin with what I think will start off with some provocative thoughts. Let's think about the intersection of race and medicine. Let's be willing to explore some uncomfortable truths and let's be clear to revisit and carry forward compelling lessons, that is things that we've learned over the last just 15 months. 
there are no relevant disclosures that impact the dialogue that I'm trying to host with you today. But there is a more relevant disclosure that really brings the focus, the emphasis on race and medicine to a peak. And that's my own journey. Let me begin by looking you in the eye and telling you that I am the descendant of slaves. In fact, I know for a fact that my great grandparents were the children of slaves and I in turn am now a descendant of slaves. My own acculturation comes from my early life and living experiences in the deep south. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana officially, but actually was Scotlandville, a segregated, unincorporated community just adjacent to Baton Rouge. And as recently as two years ago, a community that still is at or below the United States poverty level. I grew up in a single parent household. I was educated entirely in segregated schools, schools that were so segregated because of the influence of the Jim Crow laws enacted, particularly post-World War II. It wasn't until I got to medical school, in fact, that I went to an institution where there was a majority population. My acculturation involved a number of personal encounters with the Ku Klux Klan and all of the ugliness and the painful discourse that accompanied those kinds of encounters. I personally drank from colored water fountains. I personally rode in the back of a bus. In fact, we had a separate city bus service because Baton Rouge would not accommodate black citizens on city buses. And so we had a different bus service that was only black to navigate from Scotlandville to Baton Rouge. I watched movies from the balcony of theaters. I ate meals that my mother paid for in the kitchen of restaurants because we weren't able to sit in the front. I was falsely accused multiple times. And I was constantly told that my dream of becoming a doctor would never materialize and I should stop dreaming. I attended an historically black college and university. It's the only thing I could afford, even though I was invited to apply to noteworthy other institutions, but there were simply no resources to even follow through on any of those steps. I borrowed money literally past the hat amongst my family members to get the $800 needed to hold my place at Tulane where I attended medical school. And once I got to Tulane Medical School, and if there's anyone of my era that's in the audience, you will recall the Charity Hospital of New Orleans was the legacy, the prototypical safety net hospital, but it also was a bastion of segregation. The hospital was built as an exact mirror image, standing in the middle, everything on the left was replicated on the right. And it was the CRW on the patient's admission card that dictated which direction the patient would go for inpatient care. That's my journey. Those are my experiences. And it demonstrates to you how deeply embedded race is in even early childhood and certainly in one's matriculation through the educational experience with a goal of becoming a medical professional and it's still dealing with this experience with this burden of race and medicine as an emerging physician. So for 2021, thinking about everything that we've been through, and I gave you the reference that's in contemporary lay press as we speak, a really important question emerges. How does my race or anyone's race ethnicity intersect with medicine? I'm fairly confident that in South Florida, I am not speaking to a homogeneous population. There are different religions in the room. There are different ethnicities in the room. There are different races in the room. There are different countries of origin in the room today amongst the 100 or so that are listening to this. What can I tell you uniquely about this intersection of race and medicine? What I can share with you are a number of uncomfortable truths. The reason for exploring these uncomfortable truths is not for any kind of disruptive moment, but rather to establish the set point. What is it that evolved in our origins of medicine in North America that have led to the way in which we intersect race and medicine. 
there have been a litany of events, in fact, that really define this intersection. These are not all of the events, only some of the events. I did not introduced the glomerular filtration rate race correction because that's been written about profusely in contemporary literature. But there is the same race correction in pulmonary function testing, a race correction based on no science, no biology, and is there to endorse the notion that biologically Blacks were different and it was meant to qualify slavery and heavy physical labor by those that trumpeted this during the 19th century. What a Mississippi appendectomies? This is egregious. Women were taken to operating rooms in the 1940s and 50s by physicians under the guise of an appendectomy, but instead for surgical sterilization without their consent, without their knowledge, without knowing that it was done. Why would I incorporate the Flexner report in a discussion about a litany of events that set the way in which race and medicine are intersected. The Fluxon Report is appropriately identified as the inflection point where medicine and the education to become a physician went from something that was unstructured, that was boisterous, that was not based in science, to something that was more orderly, more gentlemanly, if you will. And I do mean these words gentlemanly because it was for the most part sex specific in the early 20th century. But importantly, there was no rigor in scientific requirement. And so we appropriately celebrate the Flexner Report. But there is an underbelly in this report. Flexner believed that the appropriate place for the Negro in health and healthcare was in jobs of hygiene and disproportionately offered back to the Carnegie Foundation that endorsed the development of this report, a recommendation that closed all the two of the minority serving medical schools. I'll get back to this point later in my presentation. The Tuskegee experience really merits inclusion on this list of a litany of events. So 40 year evaluation, test, experimentation, what are the consequences of untreated syphilis? It is a bit unnerving to realize that just within the last several years that the last participant in or spouse of a participant pass away. But children are alive now whose parents were part of this experience. And so we have to understand that there is enough cultural recall that the Tuskegee experience as it existed inserted a wound, W-O-U-N-D, in the soul of an entire population. And then what about the HeLa cells, this remarkable cell line that has yielded so much insight in the pathobiology of cancer was harvested from Henrietta Lacks in the 1950s. She was received surgery for cervical cancer. And unlike any other cell line, once removed from the body, it did not die. It perpetually divided and continues to do so and has been the source for many discoveries, but yet there has been very little recognition of the gift of the HeLa cells. The cells have been exploited. And in my time spent at the NIH, I served as chair of the HeLa cell task force, which was intended to bring some structure, some order to the use of these cells. And I now sit on the Henrietta Lacks Foundation to raise philanthropic funds to support the descendants of Henrietta Lacks that have otherwise been so disaffected by the use of their maternal ancestors' cell line. But there is a chronology of bias that we must respect in medicine. That chronology starts in 1790 by Benjamin Rush with the first mention of race in the curriculum. Race that was identified as a particular kind of disease, normalizing whiteness. Now it's important to know that Benjamin Rush was an avowed abolitionist and abhorred slavery. But in his efforts to explain race in medicine, he normalized everyone to whiteness and determined that blackness was a particular kind of leprosy. What about several decades later, when the father of modern gynecology, who is credited with developing surgical techniques that are the underpinning of techniques used today, 
developed those techniques by experimenting on enslaved women in Alabama without the benefit of anesthesia. What about just two decades later, when Josh Knott again tried to qualify slavery as a biologically appropriate skill set for Africans based on their phenotype? And then post Civil War, the Jim Crow era emerged and by law declared that there should be a difference between the races. And this included medical research, medical care. And it wasn't until a century later that the Human Genome Project finally declared that there's no biological basis for disease. But there was an important book published in 2018 by Harriet Washington, Medical Apartheid. I think we all understand the root word apartheid. This is the quote, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. It would seem in the context of what I've shared with you, particularly from this book, Medical Apartheid, that these statements are appropriately in reference to the chronology and the litany that I've just shared with you. But instead, this was stated by the chief US prosecutor, Robert Jackson, in the opening statement at the Nuremberg doctor's trial attesting to the egregious insults inflicted upon Jewish people. So we begin to see that we cannot disarticulate health, healthcare, and medicine from our social constructs, because clearly there is an interdigitation of the social environment with many different cohorts, and that influences the way in which we understand medicine and practice medicine. So if that history lesson illuminated some of the context, some of the cultural set points, then what did 2020 do? It brought about the pandemic, but not just the pandemic. It was the pandemic and the disproportionate burden experienced by persons of color so aptly captured in the American Public Media Research Lab website that up through March of this year on a monthly basis, aggregated the data by state regarding deaths due to COVID-19 as a function of race and ethnicity. These were the final findings that were placed on the website, key findings through March 2nd. I want you to look very carefully at these data. Everyone has felt the burden of COVID-19. Let me be clear about that. But one out of every 555 Black Americans is now dead due to COVID-19. One out of every 390 Indigenous Americans is now dead. One out of every 680 Latino Americans is now dead due to COVID-19. The same for white Americans now dead due to COVID-19. But this disproportionality as a function of race does not disappear. The site now does something even more important. It is transitioned from capturing the deaths, and you can see the excess deaths loss in the narrative at the bottom of this graphic, but now captures the vaccination disproportionality. And it demonstrates once again, that for reasons that we can explore, there is a race-based disproportionality in the way the COVID-19 vaccines have been received, innumerable reasons to explain this, but when you look at the disproportionate burden of the disease as a function of race, and then juxtapose that with the disproportionate access or uptake of vaccine, you recognize that we still have some persistent nagging pernicious tensions based on race as we think about the recent pandemic that is still ongoing, by the way. Early in this experience in April of 2020, to be specific, we entered one of the first accounts describing COVID-19 in African-Americans who did this in JAMA. It's been highly cited and highly regarded. I won't take you through the science here, but I will take you to this statement. We argued that this was it. This was the bellwether event that finally exposed the full extent to which healthcare disparities exist in this country. Underpinning of that gets us to yet another critical definition. And this critical definition is about racism. 
I told you in the beginning, this would be a very different kind of grand rounds because this is taking what I hope you can appreciate is a fact-based methodical approach to understand this intersectionality of race and medicine. And now looking at COVID-19 and the pandemic, understanding that it exposed these great differences and that at the core of these differences, in fact, exists racism. But what is racism? All of us, all of us should be disaffected and terribly disturbed by any mention of racism, particularly in a personal context. But if we take a scholarly approach, we start with the definition, a definition that is plainly stated on this graphic. But we also remember, and we highlight the fact that it's a multi-dimensional definition. There is the painful personal racism that I experienced as a young child growing up in the Deep South. There's a cultural racism where we approximate so many things to stereotypes, but then there's the institutional racism where by design, infrastructures, policies are designed that enable one group and diminish another group. So when we talk about racism, we have to be careful that we're not using it as a broad brushstroke. We are respecting the fact that there are different dimensions of this phenomenon. This is yet another statement we placed in the literature at the height of the experience with the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was discussing this parallelism that has emerged between the healthcare disparities, the Black Lives Matter movement, and then the intersection of both of those with academic medicine. And here I had an opportunity to really in a first person narrative describe racism in a way that many people have been able to better appreciate it. As a child, racism makes you feel lost and afraid. As a young adult, racism leaves you on the outside looking in. As a young aspiring professional, racism makes you start at the back, work twice as hard for half as much. And as a mature adult, racism makes your soul grieve. And this is racism not limited to Blacks. This involves Latinos. This can be applied to sexism. This can be applied to xenophobia. This can be applied to life for persons living with disabilities. It is a sense of being on the out that really qualifies as the personal experience with racism. So let's get to the next compelling lesson. We've given the history, we've given some definitions about racism, but what about bias? What is bias? This is compelling lesson number three. So how many tempers do you see? I'll pause for a moment. Do you see four? Do you see three? Clearly, these are illusions, but there may be more than illusions. Look at the next several images and think about how they make you feel. This is me in the middle of 800 of my colleagues observing nine minutes of silence one year ago at the time of the murder of George Floyd. This is just north of Chicago in Kenosha, Wisconsin, when a young man was shot and there were protests because of this experience. This is an unfortunate moment where a man lost his life and another man is facing life in prison at the same time of the Kenosha, Wisconsin disruption. This is in my own city, Chicago, a city that I love and enjoy 11 years living here, but just blocks away from where I'm seated. The city was under siege, looting and violence in public view. How do these images make you feel? How do these images make you feel? These are private citizens exercising their right of free speech, their right to bear arms, their right to express themselves. How do these images make you feel? And what about January 6, 2021? How do these images make you feel? I think everyone has to take a deep breath now because I have forced us to revisit some very unsettling moments in our contemporary history. I forced us to listen to this history of racism in medicine. I forced us to work through the litany of infamous events and then looking at the chronology of bias and I've given you definitions and then presented images that are unsettling. As you think about these first 15 or 20 minutes, how have you been processing information? Have you been dealing with sadness, despair? Did you see police brutality? Did you think about looting? Did you think about violence? Did you think about anarchy? 
Or did you think about civil protests, freedom of speech, the right to bear arms? Did you think about social justice? Did you think about Black Lives Matter? Did you think about democracy? Did you think about equity? Here's the point. All of us process these life and living experiences, these images with a subconscious, very fast neural network that allows us to have initial responses. But then we also have the opportunity to be more deliberate, to be more cerebral and process these same images slower and come up with different conclusions. The substance of this theory was related to the groundbreaking work of economists who ultimately won the Nobel Prize, Daniel Kahneman to be specific. So it's very clear that there are neural networks at play that help us understand life experiences and help us process images. That gets us to this important moment, implicit bias. I wanna be very clear, me included, all of us operate with implicit bias. It's ubiquitous in society. All persons are affected. It is informed by our own experiences and it is defined as a preference for one group over another that is unconscious and automatic. And it's very clear in this sample, these data published in JAMA are from medical students. This is not random community, but medical students where regardless of their demographic, there's a 70% preference for white persons, particularly white men. That's data. It's not theory, that's data. And we've replicated those data here at Northwestern because I run our bias course and each year test our enemy medical students and we see the same metrics. This is the reason why it's important. This is so germane to who we are as doctors. We have an interface with the patient, the left upper part of the screen. We listen intently, we acquire subjective information, and then we upload objective data points, test results, findings on a physical examination. And then we have this moment of interpretation. The interpretive eye in yellow here can go one of two directions. If that interpretive eye understands the patient's context, understands the social, economic, and cultural influences in that patient, it's a very good chance that the interventions will be favorable. But if that interpretive eye is jaded by bias or stereotyping or worse prejudice, then the decisions are not quite so favorable. You can take whichever disease process you want and use this to understand why there's more limb amputations as a function of race, why there's more use of dialysis as a function of race, why there's maybe less heart transplantation as a function of race, less use of statins, less use of newer anticoagulants, all of the things I'm suggesting to you are statements that are evidence-based and appear in the literature. The same thing you said about the application of TAVA for critical aortic stenosis. It makes us experience another uncomfortable truth. When we go beyond the biology of disease that we all embrace, we all understand, there's another big important variable that determines how we execute healthcare and is controlling our implicit biases that can incline us towards making health promoting decisions or health disturbing decisions. I am going to hopefully play a six minute videotape here that will be illustrative. If someone can assure me that you can hear this, I'll play it now. can hear it. Thank you. Is this racism? Are we, is this racism in society and in healthcare or is? Um, racism is a significant contributor, I think, um, to it in, in multiple ways. Some ways in which the racism is obvious to individuals and many ways in which the racism is not obvious to individuals. So let me give a couple examples. Back in around 2000, I was uh, invited by the Institute of Medicine to serve on a committee um, that was going to address the question, what happens when Blacks and other minorities get into healthcare context in the United States? Um, is there, does their race or ethnicity make a difference in terms of the medical care they received? The report by the IOM released in 2003 
it was called unequal treatment. And what it documented, it was a, across virtually every class of medical procedures from the, the most simple to the most complex, Blacks and other minorities receive poorer quality care and less intensive care. We were not addressing issues of access. The question was, given access to care, is there a difference in the quality of care received? And we found absolutely yes. there was a, a striking um, difference. We do not believe, we did not believe, the Institute of Medicine Committee did not believe, I do not now believe that the American physicians wake up in the morning and say, how am I going to get my minority patients today? I, I truly think that most medical doctors go to work and other healthcare providers and try to do their best for their patients. If that's true, then there's a conundrum. <laughs> Is it possible with people with good intentions seeking to do their best can nonetheless, at the aggregate level, create a pattern of care that is so discriminatory. Our answer was implicit bias. Um, it's also called unconscious or unthinking discrimination. And when the IOM concluded that that was a contributor um, in, in 2003, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence. Today, the evidence is even stronger than it was then that implicit bias exists among physicians and other healthcare providers and that that implicit bias affects the quality of care they provide to minority patients. Can you help us understand a little better this implicit bias? So I'm, I'm a doctor, a patient comes in, white, African-American, what, what happens in my conscious or unconscious or in, in the interaction that becomes a generator of the kind of inequity you're talking about? It's a great question. What the research shows is that most of us, and this is about not white people, this is about human beings, most of us think that we are, are driven by, by our conscious cognitive conditions. In fact, a lot, a lot of what we do um, occurs at, at a level beyond our conscious awareness um, and is importantly driven by ideas and, and narratives and stereotypes that have been deeply embedded in us as part of the culture or the society in which we were raised. There's a lot of research that indicates that in American culture, um, African-Americans, for example, are presented as lazy and dangerous and violent. Uh, those are negative characteristics. Um, healthcare providers are part of the larger society. Research using the implicit association test, which is one test that tries to get at these unconscious implicit biases, finds that over 70% of all Americans have an anti-Black bias. And the number for physicians is also over 70% because they are part of the larger society. We are products of the culture. So it's, it does not reflect then the behavior of bad people. It reflects the behavior of normal Americans who are reflecting the biases and the messages about race that they have received. Importantly, what the research shows is that when we have this negative implicit bias, this negative stereotype, even though we personally are committed to egalitarian principles, without our conscious awareness, when we meet someone who fits that stereotype, we will treat them differently and honestly will be unaware that we did it because there was no intent on our part. And that's why it's called unconscious, unthinking discrimination. It's implicit, it's not explicit. You're not looking at that person and saying, I'm gonna discriminate against them. In fact, if I asked you if you did, you'd say I didn't because there was truly no intent. So it's, it's something that, um, we need to raise awareness le levels of, there are a number of strategies that can be used to help um, clinicians and all persons uh, become aware of this tendency that we have. The other point I would, I would say, this is, not just, this, is, this is not just about race. Race is, is very salient. Uh, when we meet someone in American society, the research shows, we first put them into social boxes based on age, gender and race. So race is one of the, the three big factors, social factors that we focus on, but it is a more general phenomenon. If I have implicit biases or negative stereotypes about fat people, about gay people, about old people, 
about women, those same processes occur. So I like to tell my students that I am a prejudiced person because I am a normal human being. And if we are normal human beings, we are prejudiced because it, whatever society we were raised in has, has raised us with, with negative beliefs about some outgroup. Every society has in-groups and out-groups. So the question just becomes who belongs to an out-group in the society in which you were raised, which means might be implicit in my own mind. I think that was an illustrative um, video because it really helps frame the themes that I'm developing with you today. Let's go on to compelling lesson number four, because if I'm helping us all think differently about the intersection of race and medicine, understanding how we got here, working through some definitions, challenging, our, challenging ourselves to understand bias, what then should we do about race and medicine? We've introduced some concepts about this in the literature as of late. This was just four months ago, and it was written um, in conjunction with input from John Anitas at Stanford and Neil Poe at UCSF. And the idea was to understand as we continue to think about race in contemporary healthcare, in particular in research, is there a right way to do this? And we started out with a premise that cannot be disputed. Race does not infer biology. That's a hard stop. But race does capture other important dimensions. It may be a surrogate of the social construct, but importantly, there are new indices that allow us to measure more precisely what that entails, the area deprivation index, for example, the social vulnerability index. Race still has a role in research because it helps us divulge, expose the ongoing evidence of health inequities and healthcare disparities. But we also have to recognize that the presence, the mention of race per se, may in fact serve as a surrogate for the persistent presence of racism in medicine. And so we endorse the ongoing use of race in a very limited dimension, but dissuade everyone from using race to infer any biology. We've taken a step further in the literature. and We've argued that if in fact the reason for using race is to make an inference to ancestry, then the sufficient tools exist in the research domain we can use ancestry data, as I shared with the cardiology section this morning, talking about heart failure in African Americans, or we can use very carefully acquired genomic information, recognizing that our genomic architecture does not fully represent the contribution from persons of African ancestry. Point being is that there really is a way in 2020 and beyond, and now 2021, to think of race very differently. So let's get to lesson number five. What is a healthcare disparity? This is lifted from the same exercise that my good friend and colleague David Williams referred to in the video. This is from unequal treatment and output from the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, defining in clear terms what's a disparity. And this is your MOC question. A difference in health outcomes between minorities and non-minorities, even when there's equal access to care, is not sufficient to declare that there's a disparity. In fact, it is only a disparity when that difference is not attributable to patient preference or clinical appropriateness, but because of something built into the system, a barrier, if you will, or the influence of biases and stereotyping that changes the way in which you make a health care decision. That's where it becomes a disparity. So if that's the case, then let's think about how do we go back to communities and understand their contribution. And we're getting back to the opening statements I made about the pandemic, because you can argue that all I shared with you was race-based data. That doesn't qualify as a health disparity. Let me show you how that qualifies as a health disparity. As we just mentioned, there are variables that we can capture now that allow us to measure the social context. Importantly, each US census 
has 15 variables that are aggregated to populate what's called a social vulnerability index. The scores range from zero to one. Zero is the lowest vulnerability, highest resilience. One is highest vulnerability, lowest resilience. And this is resiliency when confronted by major external stresses like a pandemic, others are stated on the graphic. I am today sitting in downtown Chicago on the campus of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I am in street of them. What do you think the social vulnerability index is here? It is very close to zero, the lowest vulnerability and the highest resilience. Move 10 miles south and you can expect what I'm going to share with you. The vulnerability is as close to one as you can get. The resiliency is as low as possible. Share that with you because now I'll share this with you, thinking about the disproportionality of COVID-19. These are the cases by zip code in Chicago. What drove us to write the April 2020 statement in JAMA was the research that demonstrated that the majority of this disproportionate burden of COVID-19 in Chicago came from just five communities in these four zip codes, some as well from the Western communities that are home to Latinos. That really argued that it may be place, even more so than race, that's driving these COVID inequities. But let's take this another step further. Let's now take this social vulnerability index that I've just defined for you and portray it by zip code. And now what happens when we overlay the COVID cases? We see that this disproportionality exactly aligns with the communities that have the greatest vulnerability and the least resistance. That would argue that there are reasons beyond race to explain this disproportionality. What might that be? This may be the most uncomfortable truth that we will deal with in this hour, structural racism. I'll only read the first sentence, but it's a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. This statement from C.S. Lewis is profound. The greatest evil is not done in those sort of dens that Dickens loved to paint, but is conceived and ordered, moved, seconded, carried, and minuted in clear, carpeted, warm, well-lighted offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth, shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voices. That is to say that people, humans, generate policies and some of these policies are configured in a way that barriers are erected that lead to an exclusion of some and an inclusion of others. Now, how does all of this come back to COVID-19? Trying to make the argument that the disproportionality we see in race-based outcomes of COVID-19 reflects almost an egregious example of a disparity. Remember, policy is sufficient to qualify such a disparity. There was a post-World War I New Deal enterprise known as a homeowner loan corporation, which was intended to spur mortgages and home ownership post-World War I. This corporation was tasked with assigning credit worthiness to allow government-backed mortgages, but it was heavily influenced by segregation. A D grade represented the lowest credit worthiness and the highest risk of loss, and the D communities were outlined in red. Yes, this is the origin of redlining. And the adjacent communities that were C communities were highlighted in yellow. This is the original map from the Home Owners Loan Corporation of Chicago. You see the red communities and you see the yellow communities. And now when you look at where residents live, you saw that once this was enacted, more African-Americans remained in red line communities rather than moving to yellow islands where there was a greater and easier access to mortgages again because of segregation. So you take these data points and upload the map of the COVID-19 fatalities and the social vulnerability indices. It is remarkable that a system put in place 90 years ago may be in part, not solely, but in part the root cause of the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 deaths in communities of color in Chicago. 
that qualifies as a disparate outcome as the pandemic so clearly revealed. Here is a greater irony. Where I'm seated now in Streeterville, there's a rail line that traverses due south. And as one traverses due south, by the mile, life expectancy gets lower and lower and lower until you reach Inglewood, where the difference in life expectancy is 30 years. The name of that rail line is the red line. Definitely an ironic nomenclature in Chicago. So as we start to close, and we've been thinking about this appropriate discussion about race and medicine driven by all of contemporary events, and we started with how it all began, we've gone through the chronology of bias, the living events, we've thought about the important glossary, we've defined racism as difficult as it was, we've defined bias, we've used images to help us face our own biases, and then we've listened to a very scholarly discourse from David Williams and Don Berwick to understand how that interfaces with medicine. And then we've used COVID-19 yet again as an example of this, and we qualified what we've seen in COVID-19 as a disparity based on policies that created barriers. How do we get over this? Well, step one is we try to overcome our own implicit bias, consider a different perspective, recognize that there may be more depth, more substance than you might think is initially present, be careful to train your subconscious thought process to slow down so you can process more content. Be willing to think unconventionally and check any assumptions you have at the door. Every clinic I have a resident, sometimes a medical student working with me, and I know the patient we're about to see many times, and I qualify the visit by instructing the resident and especially the student to take a deep breath, exhale, just as I did with you at the beginning of this lecture, to check your assumptions at the door. Step two, build an anti-racist culture. Remarkably, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology just last month was a very important statement on what are the benchmarks of an anti-racist culture. This is a mainstream conversation in professional societies. Look at recruitment and culture, look at training and teaching infrastructure, look at career cultivation and promotion, look at day-to-day -day actions and look at a personal level. These are the five pillars, the five benchmarks that really are part of building an anti-racist culture. Step three, champion diversity. This gives people a lot of pain and anguish because everyone wants to target becoming more diverse. But here's the reason why. Holden Thorpe, the editor of Science says, and then science and scientists finally need to listen to and make space for people of color to leave laboratories that publish great science, produce influential scientists, run institutions and their scientific units and propel science and other journals to promote structurally underfunded scientists in areas of science. And in the same dialogue, a prominent African-American woman who is a basic science investigator offered this very pithy but appropriate statement. How much creativity are we leaving on the table because science repeatedly fails to come to terms with our narrowly defined processes and our limited ways of determining success. So when we think about diversity, I want to be very clear with everyone still listening, and I'm pleased that some of you have remained engaged with this commentary, it's still approximately 100 listening, and I hope the end really provides some take-home messages. Diversity is not about representativeness. You can accomplish that very easily with the right amount of capital assets. It really is about a path towards excellence. You may push back at that, but look at what corporate America has taught us. From the Harvard Business Review, leaders who create inclusive environments where diverse voices are welcome and engaged were nearly twice as likely as others to achieve value-driving insights, and employees were 3.5 times as likely to contribute to full innovative potential. What leader wouldn't want to see that outcome? From Deloitte and Tooge, the case for an inclusive culture, organizations with an inclusive culture two times as likely to meet or exceed financial targets, three times as likely to be high performing, six times more likely to be innovative and agile, and eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. And from Forbes, this is profound. Looking at the quality of decision-making, when all white, all male teams are making decisions in the corporate place, post hoc, 58% of those decisions were determined to be better decisions, to be good decisions. 
But as you move forward with gender diversity, age and gender diversity, and an age, gender, geographic, race, and ethnicity diversity, the likelihood for making good decisions, better decisions, goes from 58% all white, all male, to 87%. Corporate America has figured this out, but organized medicine still struggles with this. It all began with the Flexman Report. I've shared with you that the closure of minority serving institutions as depicted here in this extrapolation analysis, looking at prototypical communities like Nashville, New Orleans, Louisville, really led to a deficit in physicians. We can see that these are the remaining medical schools that are minority serving, there are four schools. Based on their metrics of the students that graduate, we can now look at these data and approximate what might have happened had we remained with an adequate number of minority serving institutions. That led to a deficit of over 35,000 minority physicians. So this is what happened to the pipeline. In one publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at racial and ethnic groups and the national medical student body painfully depicts once again, the poor representation as a function of race or ethnicity for men and women. It does highlight that more women are attending medical school. There's been a drop in whites and an increase in Asians, but for underrepresented minorities, the numbers are still paltry. If we look at comparative data compared to the US Census, we see that there are still shortcomings that are quite striking, particularly for some groups like Native Americans. And so we still have an evident problem. Beyond the pipeline, we have yet another problem. Look at this scale from the AANC. The vertical axis is matriculation of underrepresented minorities in medical school. The horizontal axis is representation of underrepresented minority faculty members at those schools. And the scales, the slopes reflect at the assistant professor, associate professor, and professor level. You see that the greatest representation of underrepresented minorities are in those schools where a greater proportion of professors emanate from the URM category. I think the message there is quite provocative. It's not causal, but the associations are very compelling. We've introduced in the literature a bold plan. Either current medical schools specifically increase by just one, by just one, the underrepresented minority medical students they educate, or we introduce a fifth minority serving medical school. Before anyone says that that's impossible, it's too expensive, the cost for starting a medical school is about one third the cost for investigating and going from bench to market a new cardiovascular therapeutic drug or device. And so it is possible, it's just a reflection of what is our will. So I'll close with this to leave sufficient time for a few questions. I won't read the Leonardo da Vinci quote, it's there for your own perusal. But I do think the Clayton Christensen quote is very important. Clayton Christensen was a recognized, as highly esteemed lecturer in the Harvard School of Business. He died approximately a year ago before the real height of the pandemic. He knew his death was imminent. This is a statement. This is my final recommendation. Think about the metric by which your life will be judged, not by your accolades, but by the people you've helped and make a resolution to live every day so that in the end, your life will be judged as success. What I try to do for you this afternoon is to take a very difficult subject and attempt it to have a plain spoken, transparent, hopefully scholarly discourse about race and medicine. It is a top of mind issue in today's world. It's something about which we all need to be aware. I've tried to give you history, definitions, examples, case studies, and a path going forward. I hope that some of this has been in keeping with the spirit of the Richard Pallet lecture series, and I hope some of this will help influence your decision-making and your care of the patients you see and the science you execute. Again, my thanks to Dr. Weiss for this invitation. I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Dr. Yancey, thank you so much for this inspiring, important, timely, uh, and, and scholarly discussion of a topic that we cannot hear too much about at any one point in time. Although we here in Miami um, have uh, 
mobilized tremendous forces and have a multifaceted task force to address the issues that you've discussed. We are continually trying to strive to be better and to uh, remove any vestige of structural racism that exists and any barriers that exist for, 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 for anyone. And it's a, uh, a very important discussion. And not only is it in keeping with the, uh, the objectives of the lecture, it's in keeping with the very precepts of what specifically the University of Miami is about, the Department of Medicine, but more importantly, what all universities need to be about because we really need to be the leaders in changing society's thinking about these things. So thank you very much. At this point, sure. I'll open up uh, the, the, uh, the, the podium, so to speak, for <laughs> discussion or comments from any of the uh, faculty or anyone that's in the audience. Oh, Please I have a me. question. Go ahead, Dr. Um, so, um, I, uh, so I'm actually from Mississippi, so I think this is a very timely topic and I think it's definitely well needed. Um, I was curious because I actually listened to the, I was following with JAMA the whole, um, I guess like the scandal surrounding the podcast release about structural racism and the subsequent dismissal of Howard Bachner as the editor in chief of, of JAMA. Uh, I was wondering to get your response to that and whether you thought that was appropriate and whether you thought that does more towards helping the cause or it's pushing some people out who need to be allies in this moment? So thanks very much for your question. Um, the correct... determination has not been made by this position. But the substantive part really is what do you do when you have difficulty in this space? You've appropriately identified why I offered this content for internal medicine grand rounds, because it's very clear from that jam experience that many of us are paralyzed by these conversations, polarized by content. And some of us execute some misstatements because we don't fully appreciate the depth and breadth of these sensitive issues. And so it really validates the importance, just as Roy articulated, we can't have enough of these conversations. It makes some of us uncomfortable to have these conversations, to hear these conversations. It pains some of us to acknowledge a history that's very difficult. You mentioned Mississippi. I have a number of experiences from my early childhood in Mississippi. But the point is that if we don't do these things, if we don't ventilate after the jam experience, if we understand how we come out of that in a different way and do things differently and do things better, we will be destined to repeat history. And that's the main reason why the historical recitations that I went through in the beginning, I think are so important because it's only in knowing the history that we can fully appreciate why behaviors are as they are. And it's only in knowing the history that we can avoid returning to that history. So I appreciate your insight. And there'll be comments coming forward very soon about the next iterations of the JAMA Network. Thank you. Well, we've reached the top of the hour. Dr. Yancey, we know how to get in touch with you. And it's my promise that you will get another invitation to spend some time in Miami and to really understand uh, not just what the city is a wonderful city, but what we're doing in terms of uh, promoting racial justice here. So thanks so much for today and all your lectures with our cardiology uh, faculty and fellows are also greatly appreciated. Everybody remember to uh, sign in. The questions for the maintenance of certification are indeed about the topic that Dr. Yancey spoke about, although the advertisement was a little bit different about HEFPEF and HEFREP and all that other stuff. Enough, but this was much more important, I think, and we'll have much more long lasting when the, uh, the treatments of uh, heart failure are, are long past. So anyway, please, uh, please uh, register and thanks again, Clyde. It's a pleasure to see you again and all the best. Thanks, Be safe, everyone. Have a good day.